So if you are here, you should be interested in studying abroad in Spain, Portugal, and or Latin America. I am the OGE advisor for this region. My name is Erin Pendle, and I'll be walking you through a bit of information about the programs in this region today. And I would just like to let everyone know that at the end of the presentation, we'll go ahead and answer questions. So if you have any questions that come up as we go along, please feel free to submit them. You can do so anonymously. And with the help of my moderator, um, we, will, we will get to those questions at the end. So I would like to talk to you all about our programs in the large region of Spain, Portugal, and Latin America. Rather than going through every single program, there are too many to go into detail on, I think it would be helpful to start off by giving you a bit of an overview of what types of programs we offer. So probably one of the most um, popular program models is that of direct matriculation. So what does that mean? If a student is directly matriculating, it means that they are taking classes with degree-seeking students at a local university, or in some cases, local universities, plural, um, and doing all of their coursework in the target language. So that would mean Spanish or Portuguese for my region. We have direct matriculation programs in many countries, including Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Mexico, Portugal, and Spain. We also have another type of program, which uh, would be called language and area studies. This type of program is really great for students who may not have an advanced level of the language, but who would like to continue to learn to improve their Spanish while learning about local history and culture. A great example of this type of program is our intensive language program in Salamanca, Spain. And then finally, we have business and area studies. These are programs that, again, will allow students to sort of continue to improve their language abilities um, while learning about the local history and culture, but also while taking coursework that is specific to business students and that will allow them to earn credit towards their MSB major. It's a lovely shot of Buenos Aires. Um, so requirements, what do you need to do and able to be eligible for these programs. Students need to be in good academic and disciplinary standing. That's sort of a baseline requirement. In many cases, uh, we do need to see a GPA minimum of 3.0, but it's not in every case. So the reason that I put that asterisk there is to just indicate that if you are below a 3.0, don't count yourself out. Still come and talk to me or come meet with another advisor to talk about your eligibility and what the possibilities are for you. In my region, language is very important, obviously. So we have a different sort of um, prerequisite depending on the program. When we're talking about direct matriculation programs, students will need to have taken through advanced Spanish two or its equivalent. So that means that if you have taken this level of language and you're prepared, you are able to go abroad and sit in classes with local students taking major and minor classes and, and hanging in there and being able to um, perform to the academic level necessary to be successful. And in Brazil and Portugal, it's slightly lower. And then with our business programs, it's one year of college level Spanish or its equivalent. And with intensive language programs, um, in the case of Salamanca, beginners are welcome. Um, after a certain point, we do want you to sort of push yourself to directly matriculate. So if you've taken advance two, um, we'll talk to you about your options in the direct matriculation programs. Um, if you have questions about your level or you're not sure if, you know, for example, you're a heritage speaker and you have a lot of Spanish, but you've not taken classes yet, we can talk through all of those sort of special circumstances and get you where you need to be. So this is just to kind of give you an overview of what the language level requirements are. So many times students will be very excited about the prospect of studying abroad, but they're concerned about the financial 
uh, implications or the, the finances related to these opportunities. So we are very good, I think, in OG about providing a lot of information to students upfront as it relates to the cost of study abroad. If you go to our program brochures, you'll see a breakdown of tuition and fees that are specific to each program. So in every program brochure, you'll see fixed expenses, which are the things that are billed to your Georgetown student account, including tuition and health insurance, which covers you while you're abroad. In terms of estimated expenses, these differ from program to program. So they account for things like the cost of airfare, um, room and board, personal expenses. If there are other uh, categories of expenses or costs that we anticipate you'll need to spend money on, this is where we capture this so that when we share this information with our partners in financial aid, they have the full scope of what it will cost for you to attend and participate on these programs. Georgetown Financial Aid is portable. We always encourage you to speak with your financial aid counselor sooner rather than later about your plans to study abroad and, and what that will mean for you. Um, as I said, program budgets are available on our website and there are also scholarships available depending on where it is you're studying abroad and your background and what you're planning to study, etc. So we can talk more in depth um, with you about all of these things when you come to meet with us for an appointment. So as I was saying at the start, we have so many programs in this region and there are a lot of exciting things that you can do. Um, a couple of programs that I wanted to highlight in particular are those that we run in Madrid and Salamanca, Spain. So the Georgetown in Spain programs are ones that are GU signature programs where we have a resident director and a program assistant and they are long running programs that we've been sending students on for over 25 years in the case of Madrid um, and we have really well established relationships and really strong programs. So just to kind of give a quick plug of these, um, the Georgetown and Madrid program, we have two different tracks. You can study abroad at the Complutense, which is a large public university, or at the uh, Pontificia Comillas, which is a smaller Catholic university, private university. Um, here you can see some pictures from around the city and um, same with our program in Salamanca. You can study abroad. Actually, in this case, you can cross enroll at both the Universidad de Salamanca, which is the larger public institution, and the Pontificia. Um, if you would like to have more information about these programs, before I forget, I do want to just mention that tomorrow we will be having a presentation specifically highlighting these two um, programs. So you can come join us at 10 a.m. Eastern if you want to hear more about those. But essentially, these are the most popular programs that I advise for. Many students will go and study in Spain and take classes at the university, really improve their language, um, earn major and minor credit by, through, by way of their coursework, um, experience a lot of intercultural growth and learning and take advantage of really exciting opportunities such as um, excursions throughout the country and, and throughout the region with the, with the group, um, intercultural workshops, we have language certification workshops if you're interested in that, just so many different things that I could go on and on about. But tomorrow we'll talk more in depth about those. So if you're interested, come back and see us um, to talk more about those. In general, if you have any questions or you're looking for more information, as I said, I'm the advisor for the region and I would love for you to make an appointment to meet with me. Um, you can also, of course, visit our website to kind of do a bit of research beforehand. We have that listed up here. Um, our program brochures go into a little bit more depth and more information about each program and the fields of study that are offered, the type of coursework, um, more uh, just details on, on all of the different things that you might have questions about. And then um, we also really recommend that you speak with you know, peer advisors and your dean as, as we get closer to the time that you're thinking of applying to study abroad. It's important that you 
uh, discuss your plans with your dean and your academic advisors to make sure that you're prepared and, and have everything in place to uh, be successful and to continue to make academic progress. So with that, I'll just um, show you a few more different um, resources if you have more questions or you're looking for more information. But I think we're ready to open it up now to questions. So if um, Karen, you have any that have been submitted that you'd like to share with me, that would be great. Hi, Erin. Thank you for all that great information. Um, my name's Karen. I'm the moderator. Please feel free to submit your questions um, in the uh, Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. We've had a few questions come in um, regarding host families, mostly um, can, can I live with a host family or do I have to live with a host family? Great. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So in each of our sites, there are um, different established program housing options for students. And all students are required to live in program housing. So depending on where it is you're looking to study abroad, you may be um, able to live with a host family or to live in a residence hall. Um, I would say in the case of all of the programs that I advise for, host families are an option. Um, in some cases, residence halls are not an option depending on the availability or if that's something that's um, culturally done in the region. So that would be a great place to look, um, or excuse me, the program brochure would be a great place to look for detailed information on that, depending on the program you're interested in. But in general, yes, you can absolutely live with a host family when you're studying abroad in Spain and Latin America or Portugal. Our next question is, is Advanced Spanish 2 the same as Transatlantic Spanish? Yes, so depending on which track you are on in the department, you might um, see Advanced Spanish 2 as Transatlantic or they have another name that's escaping me right now. But yes, it, we, we always want to see Advanced 2 or its equivalent. So if you're in the SFS track and it's called one thing or you're in the non-SFS track, it's called another, it's, it's really kind of seen as all the same. It's six semesters worth of Spanish. Do you consider sophomores for direct matriculation if they have completed all of the requirements? That's a great question. Um, I would say that as a general rule, most students, the vast majority of students who study abroad and directly matriculate are juniors. However, there are exceptions to that rule. I've seen sophomores occasionally go abroad and I've definitely seen seniors go abroad. Um, so it would really depend on the student and I would say their maturity level, their preparedness apart from language ability, and whether or not they have the support of their school and their dean. So if you are planning for that or foresee that in your future, I think it's a great idea to just bring it up with your dean the next time you meet with them and kind of explore that as an option. Do any of these programs run during the summer and how do how does this look different from a traditional semester? Yes, absolutely. And that's a really great question. Um, we have a whole portfolio of summer programs that are faculty led, um, taught by Georgetown faculty and led abroad. The Spanish department has two long running, really successful amazing programs in Spain and in um, Ecuador. And so if you're looking for more information about those programs, you'll actually be working with a different advisor. But what I can tell you just generally is that the programs in the summer are different. So unlike my programs that I advise for where you are directly matriculating or attending a local study center with students from, from all over, these are going to be cohorts of predominantly Georgetown students and your classes will be taught by Georgetown faculty. The length of the programs can vary, so they can go, I wanna say, Karen, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, anywhere from like two weeks to six, seven, eight weeks. Um, so it really does depend on what you're looking for. Obviously with um, varying lengths, um, the cost can vary from, from one program to the next. So that's another thing. Um, whereas in the case of semester uh, programs, everyone is charged the same tuition. So it, I would say um, there's, there's so many different 
factors um, with summer programs to consider, be it length, language requirement, um, cost, et cetera. It makes a lot of sense to, to look into those programs and to meet with the advisor for our summer programs to discuss them in, in greater detail. I'm interested in going my junior year. When should I start planning my coursework? Yeah, so I think in terms of planning ahead, looking at your degree audit and planning out coursework, it's never too early to have a conversation with your dean or your academic advisors about what it is that you would like to take um, either beforehand and get out of the way or accomplish and what you'd like to save for when you're studying abroad. Um, that's a great conversation and you know can, you can really get that ball rolling as soon as you'd like. But for, for our purposes in OGE, we usually start to work with students the semester or even sometimes two semesters before they study abroad. Um, your application will be due a semester before you go. So for example, um, if you're looking to go abroad in the fall of your junior year, your application will be due um, in February of your sophomore year. So we like to get you thinking about these things and planning ahead of time so that you've got plenty of time to work things out and to get yourself prepared. Um, but I think if I understand your question, it's more what coursework should you be taking and when? And that's a really good question for your, for your dean. Any other questions? Yeah, our next question is, what is the benefit of applying to study abroad early? And Erin, I'd be happy to answer this one if you'd like. Give your voice a rest. Oh, sure. <laughs> there really um, is no benefit to studying to applying to study abroad early. We have um, application deadlines um, that uh, follow a cycle. So for fall semester and full academic year, that deadline is typically going to be in February. Um, for the spring semester, we have two deadlines depending on um, the program, um, different program requirements, and those are usually held, the deadlines are in September or October 1st. Um, and so um, you would follow that same application cycle. Um, for summer, again, our program uh, application deadline is in February. We do recommend that you don't wait until the very last minute to submit your materials so that you can get everything completed um, to the best of your ability on time, um, but there's really no benefit to applying early. Here's a great question. Can we apply to more than one program and should we apply to more than one program? Yeah, so I would say you should not unless you're planning to do a split year and that is when a student decides to spend one semester in one site and the second semester in another. Um, in general, with, with my region anyhow, there aren't any programs that are so competitive that it's necessary to have a backup application or a second application. We really spend a lot of time with students and helping them find a program that's the best fit for them in terms of their, their academic and their intercultural and their personal goals. So it's not necessary to sort of cast a wide net and apply to more than one. If for some reason your first choice is a program that is highly competitive, again, not really the, the case in my region, but perhaps in some other regions, I, I know that is a consideration. Your advisor will, will let you know and will kind of give you the context for that situation. And if necessary or if advisable, they'll recommend that you select a secondary site to make your backup application. But um, in general, you, you apply to one program and you're, you're either nominated or not. In the vast majority of the cases, you're nominated and then you, you um, proceed in pursuing that program. Um, and yeah, that, that's that. What's the major difference between studying abroad in Spain or studying abroad in Latin America? Hmm. It's, it's hard to sort of encapsulate that in, in just a quick soundbite, but I think, you know, based on my experience advising for this region, there are some differences between the, the experience um, in Spain versus Latin America. I think, you know, in, in Latin America, you are 
surrounded by other countries where Spanish or perhaps Portuguese is spoken. So when you're traveling, when you're, when you're leaving the area that you're based in, you're still in a world where Spanish is, is the language that you're speaking. Um, so that's something that kind of jumps to mind. Um, in Spain, obviously situated where it is in Western Europe, there are a lot of opportunities to, to move around the region and to see all of Spain and then of course explore other parts of, of Western Europe. So the, obviously the languages spoken surrounding Spain are different. Um, but I would say the commonalities between the two are that you're able to have a very immersive um, experience, both in terms of the academic culture and then the, the local cultures and you're able to really improve your language abilities, which I think um, for most of the students that I advise is probably their number one goal is to come back with a greater level of proficiency, whether that's for you know, their, their career or just for their own personal life. Um, in both cases, in Spain and in Latin America, we work with, we partner with um, some really fantastic comprehensive universities where students are able to take coursework that they need to accomplish or to fulfill major and minor credit as well as for those of you who are SFS students where you're able to fulfill your SFS proficiency requirement. Um, I don't want to go on and on but I would also just say that to the question earlier about housing in both cases you're able to live with a host family um, which is, I think, for a lot of students, a real highlight of their experience. It's where they're really able to get a, a greater sense of, of what it means to live like a local in their host culture um, and, and really create some bonds and, and lasting relationships. So there's a lot in common between them. I think there are, there are differences as well, but it comes down to um, the individual and what kind of suits them best. Um, here's a, a question. Can I join clubs when studying abroad? And what clubs have other Georgetown students um, participated in, particularly in Spain? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's fair to say that the club culture in Spain is, is different from that of the Georgetown campus because, um, you know, here we, in non-COVID times, all live on campus and we're together and there are a lot of, there's a lot of activity and action on the campus itself. Um, in, in Spain and in Latin America, you will definitely have opportunities to join clubs and participate in extracurricular um, activities with your peers. They might um, take a slightly different form, won't be nearly as competitive, but much more inclusive, so that's kind of a positive. Um, I'm trying to think of things that our students have done in the past. I know a lot of sports-related things. We've had students who have you know, joined running clubs or who walked on to the university basketball team in the case of one of our programs in Madrid. Um, definitely volunteering activities and um, also just more informal things like cooking classes or dance classes or ways of accessing the local culture. So yes, definitely there are um, opportunities for these things in, in all of the programs. And I believe our final question is, how can we make an appointment with you or another OGE advisor? Oh, what a great question. Yes, so you can do so from our website. Um, I think it's studyabroad.georgetown.edu slash appointment. Or um, you can also, if you're not seeing an appointment or you're confused or not finding it, email me and I'm happy to set one up for us. Um, I'm kind of constantly updating my calendar with my availability. So if you don't see an appointment, don't be dismayed. It probably just means I need to open more appointments up in my calendar. So um, yes, I will continue that. And if you, aren't, if you do see slots, but they don't work with your schedule or whatever you have going on um, this semester, always email me and I'll make a time for us to chat. And we can do it via Zoom or over the phone, whatever works best for you. All right, well, it sounds like those are all of the questions that we have for today. I really appreciate your time and 
the fact that you came to listen to a little bit about this region and study abroad in general. Um, like I said, it's a very general overview. So if you want to get more in-depth information, please take a look at our program brochures and also um, make an appointment with me and we can, we can talk further. Um, but thanks so much for your participation and we'll stay in touch.